All right, so we're in the middle of the, of the do-it-yourself exercise planning. Um, and where I ended off last time was the use of the FIT principle, frequency, intensity, time, cut, organize, and plan workouts. So where we're going to pick up here is beginning the process. And what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll actually talk about how do you specifically apply the FIT principle to a specific type of exercise. In particular, what we'll talk about is cardio respiratory. So we're moving forward here. We've designed our workout regimen using the FIT principle. So now we're beginning the process. We're actually taking action here and moving forward. So as you begin the process, one of the most important things to do, and we see this every year at the beginning of the year, people set their New Year's resolutions and they're all going home for about two days and then pretty soon it's like every other day and then pretty soon they're back to just sitting on the couch and the chips getting back. So very important that as you begin this process to make a point to train regularly. Utilize your physical activity and your training on a regular basis, train regularly. You also want to, as you're beginning the process, train gradually. So why do we train gradually? Well, one, because we have that adaptation that occurs. We respond to the level of stress and we have those physiological changes that occur. So if we start out and do too much or do too more do more than we can handle, we can run into this situation or this symptom called overtraining. And overtraining is not a fun place to be. You basically have taxed your body above and beyond the base fitness that you had when you began the process. And we want to avoid that because if you overtrain, it's going to have adverse effects on your progression through the training program and the utilization of physical activity and exercise to help regulate health and, and to have those benefits. So we want to train gradually to avoid overtraining. Then as you look at an individual training session or what I'm going to call a training bout, you should always use a warm-up prior to the activity. And typically we try to use a warm-up activity that is going to have similar movements to the activity you're about to perform. So if you're going to go out for a run, you start out slow walk and then begin the jog and then begin to run. That would be your progression for your warm up. Warm -up. If you're looking at muscle strength, start out with low weight, uh, low dumbbell or barbell weight, and go through the motions of each individual lift. And then at the end, we want to have a cool down. So cool down after activity. And what the cool down does is it allows our respiration rate to drop back down to equalize blood flow to our tissues. We get to reduce blood flow into those working tissues. It starts to help regulate body temperature. It helps to recover and pay back the oxygen debt that was created with that exercise. It helps prevent blood pooling in your lower extremities. So as you make your progression, it's going to be important to reassess fitness periodically. We want to make sure that we're actually making some progression. It's really easy to get on a scale and to get a single number and say, oh, okay, so I've lost two pounds since I began my process. But really, just weight loss isn't going to tell us a whole lot about our fitness. What's going to tell us a lot about our fitness Fitness is if we go back and repeat the same fitness tests to see if we have increased our ability to complete those tasks. So you might do another one mile run test. You might do push ups and pull ups, repeat those tests, and then compare your results. And the really interesting thing here is to be honest, you may not actually see any decreases in body weight, especially initially. And so that may get really, really discouraging to be like, I'm 
230 pounds and I need to lose some weight and you get on the scale and you're 231 pounds. But then you go repeat your fitness tests and you can run that mile a minute faster and you can do five more push-ups and you can do five more pull-ups. And so you actually get some results that show an improvement in fitness even though you may not have the loss in body weight just yet that you're desiring. One of the killers of fitness is injury. And so you need to remember safety. And there's a couple things that you can do to help out with making exercise more safe. Uh, one of those things is to, as they say, listen to your body. Now this idea of listening to your body, really what we're saying here is if you feel like your knee doesn't feel that great, it might be good to take some management steps to improve the feel of your knee. Maybe it's ibuprofen or maybe it's something as extensive as going to your doctor. So make sure that you're listening to your body. You can play through the pain because that's temporary, but you should never train through the pain because that may not be temporary. Another thing that you can do, which helps not only with safety but also with compliance to a fitness program is to find someone to do your fitness to do your training to find the training you want. Then if you get injured or you have a medical event in the middle of the woods you're not by yourself and someone actually can give you a fighting chance. Alright, so let's take a look at an example. And you should have already gone through this in the lab. We're going to use an example here of cardiac respiratory endurance. So we're going to take a look at the recommendations and we're going to make a real quick design of a cardiac respiratory endurance type pro program that you may be able to apply to improve your cardiac respiratory fitness. But before we do that, what are the actual benefits? What are the actual ben benefits? of performing cardiorespiratory injuries. I'm going to give you a hint. One of them is not accessible to this. So we're trying to get that, that out of our mind, and we're trying to focus on the true benefits, the things that are going to help you to have a better quality and a better quantity of life. So individuals who participate regularly on car in cardiorespiratory endurance type training have increased cardiorespiratory function. Literally, your heart and your lungs become more efficient. Your heart becomes more efficient at pumping blood. Your, your lungs become more efficient at exchanging oxygen with the blood to supply to the working tissue. There's an increase in cell metabolism. And you'll remember that the term metabolism is the term that we use for the collection of all the chemical reactions that are occurring within an organism. So you actually have improved cell metabolism. And by improving cell metabolism, you make a lot of your tissues more efficient. There is a known link between disease risk and individuals who regularly regularly participate in cardiorespiratory endurance training. Individuals who have a high cardiorespiratory fitness have much lower rates of heart disease, certain types of cancer, diabetes, obesity, etc. So we decrease our disease risk. Now we don't necessarily see real precipitous changes in body weight, but with cardiorespiratory endurance we have better control over body fat. So better control over our body fat. So you actually may not have 
huge losses in body weight, but what's actually happening is you have reductions in your fat mass and increases in your non-fat mass, muscle mass, things like that. Individuals who participate in cardiorespiratory fitness and training have better immune function. That means you get sick less often. There is actually some new evidence. I'm not totally sold on it myself at this point, but there's some new evidence that actually suggests that if you participate in cardiorespiratory endurance exercise during things like the flu or a cold, it actually reduces the time to recover. But certainly, regular uh, regular fitness training is going to have an effect on the immune system. It allows that immune system to be more efficient, more functional. It helps you to fight off disease better. There is a huge link between an individual's cardiorespiratory fitness and their physiological and emotional well-being. There are biological things that happen especially to the central nervous system that adjusts your emotion and those psychological responses that we have. The underlying biology really has a high level of control over what we see as emotion and psychology, and it can be regulated by physical fitness. All right, so those are the benefits. And hopefully I've convinced you that this is something you all should be doing. So how do we actually design a program. So again, this is going to be the FIT principle specifically for cardiorespiratory endurance. So you remember FIT principles, frequency, intensity, time, and type. This is the type. Cardiorespiratory endurance is the type. So we'll go through the first, the first FIT, not the whole FIT. So let's start out with frequency. So Hopefully you've all had a chance to look over that American College of Sports Medicine position to stand on the quality and quantity of uh, physical activity and exercise for adults. Does anyone happen to remember what the frequency suggestion was for cardiorespiratory endurance? So this is going to be measured in days per week. It's a three to five day per week. Recommendation. So three to five days. If you're a beginner, you're probably going to be closer to three days. If you're looking at improving fitness or maintaining your health, you're going to be closer to five days. So beginners are at three days. Okay, now that's the frequency. So cardiorespiratory endurance should be incorporated into your physical activity routine. Three five days per week, three days in or five days for more advanced. Now, for each of these three to five bouts per week, we need to identify our intensity and our time. So, in other words, how hard and how long. So, for intensity, we first have to identify some monitoring strategies. Intensity, you remember, is how hard are you going to work out? Are you going to work out really strenuous? One more moderate. And how are you going to measure strenuous versus moderate versus very strenuous versus not moderate or not strenuous? How are you going to monitor those things? <clears throat> and there are actually a couple different techniques that we can use here to monitor your intensity of a cardiovascular endurance. The first one is just simply to look at the function of the heart through heart rate. There are really two places in which to measure heart rate effectively in an active human. There's actually a bunch of different places you can measure heart rate, and we're going to measure it as simply a pulse or a feet through one of our peripheral one of our peripheral veins. I promise it's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> He is dead. <laughs> Did you check his arm? <laughs> so, um, 
Sam, who's best out there, will check in his pulse in the carotid artery. We have a vessel that runs alongside the neck. Um, the way to find it is you sort of have a groove kind of between the front of the neck and then it's a muscle right on the back, back, back neck. And if you kind of get into that groove, you can use the felt to find that, that pulse there. Now, a lot of you are doing this right now, or a few of you are doing this right now. Be very careful with the carotid artery pulse. Why should we be careful? Well, we need to be careful because this goes up into the brain. This is blood supply into the brain. And if I put too much pressure on that vessel, I can actually occlude blood flow to the brain. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when you occlude blood flow to the brain, you have a tendency to pass out. So if you're out in the middle of the woods, running away from that bear, you think I'm going really intense, and you start really hammering on that carotid artery, you pass out, it's probably all over. Some people, this is the most effective place to find that um, to find that pulse. It's very prominent. It's very well displayed for a lot of individuals. And you just simply count. And, and to, normally, it's going to count for about ten seconds, and then just multiply by six to get your measurement of beats per minute. The better alternative is the radial artery. Hopefully, you'll remember that we have a bone in the forearm of the radius bone. And there is a pulse um, that is nearby that radial bone. So when your thumb is out, it's going to be on the outside of the arm. You should be able to just kind of feel it right there. Um, it's coming from the radial artery over that radial bone in the wrist. Same concept here as the carotid artery. Count the number of pulses that you can feel. For about 10 seconds, or for 10 seconds, multiply that by 6, and that'll give you a total number of beats per minute, or the number of times your heart is pumping in a one minute time. So we're going to come back to this in just a second. I'm going to tell you how you can more effectively use pulse rate in general terms. Higher the pulse rate, more intense the exercise, lower the pulse rate, the closer the rest of the work. A second alternative is what's known as a rating of perceived exertion. Now this is much more subjective. It's not near as objective as um, the pulse rate. Because you're actually going to be like, oh, okay, I feel like I'm this intense. Ratings of perceived exertion, there's a scale out there. It's called the Borg scale, or the Borg um, scale of ratings of perceived exertion. It's a Likert scale, which just means all of your numbers are integers, and it starts at 6 and goes to 20. 6 is minimal effort or the least effort. 20 is your maximal effort. So this term Likert scale is just referencing that it's whole integers. So there's no such thing on this scale as a 6.5 or 6.3. It's either a 6 or a 7. So 6 to 20 with 6 basically being rest and 20 being your max exertion or your maximal exertion effect. Now what you'll see in this figure here is you actually have two different what are called training zones, an endurance training zone and a strength training zone. And you could use this to say 11, 12, or 13 to be in that training zone. And all again, it's very subjective. So if Sarah and I were on the treadmill running at the exact same speed, she might say 7 and I might say 20, even though things are identical. So it becomes very, very subjective. If you're not a huge fan of that subjectiveness, then use the heart rate. And you can begin to calculate the same idea of training zones using your heart rate. Typically, um, instructors of fitness and coaches apply five different training zones. And you can see each of those five different training zones has a different attribute that's associated with that training zone 
we're going to be looking at the heart rate here. We can ignore the, uh, the um, anaerobic threshold data. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about fuel, fuel utilization um, as we go through this discussion. So five different zones, and you'll notice that that heart rate zone is basically the zone here of heart rates. And the higher the heart rates, the closer you are to speed power. The lower the heart rate, the closer you are to that more of a recovery. Okay. Now these numbers that are listed here are probably not going to be valid for most of you. Maybe valid for some of you, but not for most. Of you. So I'm going to teach you how to actually set up a customized heart rate training zone document for yourself. So the first step here is to either estimate or measure your max heart rate. So estimate or measure your max heart rate. To measure your max heart rate actually requires some specialized pieces of equipment. We typically put you on a treadmill to get to an ECG, which can track your heart. And we use a treadmill protocol where we increase speed and elevation of the treadmill until we basically make you run. Um, so you can't run anymore. Uh, there's other tests. Um, one of the other tests is to go up to a track like what they have up here at White County High School. And check this out, you do 500, uh, 800, two laps on the track, 800 meters, half mile, as fast as you can, stop for one minute, and then do it again. And then at the very end, take your pulse for 10 seconds, and it gives you a really close measure of the max time. Most people have to estimate it because we don't have that specialized equipment to measure it. The way to estimate your max heart rate is to start with 220 and subtract your age. This is going to give you your estimated max heart rate. Okay, so 220 minus your age. Most of you are right around 20, so your estimated max heart rate is basically about 200. Now, there is some pretty good variation on either side of this mean. When I was 20 years old, my max heart rate, as measured by the techniques that I just described in a lab with the ECP, all that kind of stuff, was actually 181. So you can see there's a huge difference there. Some people are going to be north of that. Some people are going to be south of that number. But it's at least going to get you close to a ballpark range. So from here, we take that max heart rate and we begin to create our training, uh, our training zone. And I'm just going to give you one. If you want to do five, you can go out and do some of that exploration yourself. There's some training websites out available on the internet and some other books that you could go and take a look at. We're just going to take a look at one training zone that's going to get you in the ballpark of effective cardiorespiratory endurance. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that max heart rate. We're going to multiply that max heart rate by 65% and 90%. And in this training zone, the closer you are to 60%, 65%, the closer you are down here in this part of the, of the training zone. The closer you are to 90, you're up towards the top. In between 60 and 65 and 90, you're sort of in that middle range. So really what I'm doing here is I'm setting up the bookends. What should your heart rate be during cardiorespiratory endurance to be within an effective training range? One caveat here is if you're an unfit individual, use 55% as your lower number. So go 55 up to 90. Eventually you'll adjust that up to 65% to 90%. All right, so let's take a look at uh, an individual here who's 19 years old. Okay, so an individual who's 19 years old, a lot of you are right around 19 years of age. So someone real quick, max heart rate for this individual. Two, uh, 220 minus 19, so 201. So our max heart rate for this individual, our estimated max heart rate is going to be 201. So those two numbers that I gave you, 65% and 95%, we're going to take those numbers and we're going to multiply it out. So 65% is 
This will be the lower bookend and will signify your moderate intensity exercise. So the closer you are to 65, the closer you are to a moderate level of exercise. Now, what do we do with percentages? We always convert them into decimals, right? So this is actually going to be calculated here as 0 0.65 times my 201 times my calculator estimated max heart rate. And if you do the math, it ends up being 131 beats per minute. So this individual, when they're out for their jog or their bike drive, whatever it is, if they want to be in an optimal moderate intensity range, they have to be 131 beats per minute or just a little bit higher. Notice that individuals who, this individual here who's in that range, so we're up here at the what's called heart rate zone number two, you'll see that the primary fuel that's utilized, our primary supply of ATP is coming from the breakdown of fat. Some of it's coming from sugar or from carbohydrate, which is shown in red. So I'm talking about these bars here. So notice that if I want to have a high level of fat being utilized as my fuel source, I want to be closer to this moderate intensity level. The other side is 90%, which is going to be equivalent to our high intensity. So that high intensity, we're going to take again our decimal 0 0.90 times our max heart rate 201 gets us up to about 181 beats per minute. And what you'll see up here is you shift over to using far more carbohydrates as your fuel as you go towards these higher intensities. Now you're going to have additional benefits on the physiology for having high intensity, but if you're looking for management of fat mass and, and, and body weight, it's probably better to be closer to that moderate intensity level of exercise. Okay? So these can be some, some of those strategies that can be applied into the regulation and the um, Make a measurement of intensity during a workout. So you sit down, calculate all this stuff out for you, and then when you're out for your workout, you're looking for those two numbers or to be close to those two numbers to be at a low intensity, a moderate intensity rather or a high intensity. Everybody have all that they need here. All right, let's look at that final T. Remember, the, the last T in FITT is tight. We're talking about cardiovascular endurance. You might take it even a step further and say, okay, I'm doing cardiovascular endurance, and I'm going to ride my bike, or I'm going to use a cycle endometer, or a treadmill, or I'm going to run, whatever the case may be. So, what about the first T, which is time? The recommendation for cardiorespiratory endurance is anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes on most days of the week, okay? So that's your five days a week if you're trying to maintain or improve your fitness level. So 20 to 60 minutes. The other thing that's kind of cool here is you can actually accumulate. And I'm sure that Several of you in the room right now are saying, how the heck am I going to get 60 minutes? I don't have an extra 60 minutes. Well, the body responds in an interesting way. You can actually accumulate. And so what that means is you can break up this 20 to 60 minutes, and it doesn't have to be 60 minutes all at one time. It can be 60 minutes at all one time, and you're going to get a benefit. So one 60-minute session is going to have benefits. However, very similar benefits can be achieved with six 10-minute sessions. The minimum for an individual session has to be greater than 10 minutes. 
So maybe you're like, I don't have 60 minutes in my day, but I can put 30 minutes in right away in the morning, and then as I'm walking to class, I can walk to class faster. And you might be able to accumulate 40 to 50 minutes. And all of a sudden, you're approaching the situation to add more physical activity to your life in a way that's more conducive to fit into your very busy schedules. Another caveat here for time is related to the intensity. Intensity is going to, in part, dictate the time or the duration. So it's a 20 to 60 minute range. Typically what's recommended is if you're going to be participating in a high intensity workout, that you be closer to the 20 minute plus time. Okay. So for beginners, a high intensity workout, 20 minutes, three days a week, something along those lines. The low to moderate intensity should be closer to 45 minutes. Okay, so we've gone through and we've designed our Carter Scar Joint Endurance program. Now we're ready to go, we're ready to start utilizing the program. So what should a cardiorespiratory endurance session look like? How should this be completed to optimize this type of fitness training? As was mentioned before, we want to have a warm-up. So start out with a warm-up. The warm-up is not included in the total 20 to 60 minute time period. Warm-up is going to be an additional 5 to 10 minutes. What this warm-up is going to do is it's going to increase your muscle efficiency. It's going to increase muscle blood flow. And then it's also going to spread out the joint fluid. It's called synovial fluid inside of your joints. So remember that from when we were talking about skeletal system really early on in the semester. So it'll help to spread and distribute that synovial fluid within the joint cap caps to protect the joint function. So you come in, you do the warm-up, participate in the activity, and then apply a cool down. Cool down another five to ten minutes. What that cool down will do will help to normalize blood flow and help to slow respiration. So normalizes blood flow and prevents cooling in the lower extremities, collection of blood in the lower extremities because it's not expected to return up to the heart. It helps to slow down your breathing rate, recovers energy supply. Okay, so warm up, do the workout, and then cool down. So how do we progress? So maybe you're in that phase of your life where you're just beginning to participate in routine exercise. Maybe you're getting ready to graduate. Maybe going into a job. Uh, it's going to be a good thing to have exercise both in your daily routine. It's going to help out with your cognition. It's going to help out with your wakefulness. It's going to help out with managing the stress for that job. It's just a benefit. So you're beginning to incorporate exercise. So you're probably more like on that three days per week, 20 minutes for, uh, for your, your fit friends. You've been at it for a couple of weeks. How do we begin to progress? So the progression is typically defined as initial phase, improvement phase, and then maintenance phase. So your initial phase lasts anywhere from one to four weeks from the onset of exercise participation. And during this time, this is typically lower intensity, 
lower duration. This helps us to do what's called building your base. And it's your base fitness that you're going to build the rest of your fitness on top. If you don't have a high level of fitness, participating in activities that require a high level of fitness are far more difficult. So this is going to help you to begin to set that base uh, for your fitness level. You're going to get to the end of this initial phase. For some of you, maybe one week. For some of you, maybe closer to four weeks. And you're going to have a suitable base that's been developed, a suitable fitness base. And so now it's time to move into the improvement phase. So the improvement phase will last from two to six or more months. And the six plus months is going to be dependent upon your goals. You may not be able to achieve your fitness goals within that six month time period. So improvement phase may last much longer. In fact, you may be desiring to continue to improve fitness day after day after day. So this can become a very, very long, uh, very long phase. During the improvement phase, improvement of fitness, we've moved away from setting our base, we're now improving upon that base. You're going to move, utilize a combination of moderate and high intensity exercises. And you're going to be slowly increasing your duration. This is where the uh, progressive overload and that periodization comes into play. So this is where you start to look at day to day. So if you look at a week, you might have low intensity one week or one day and the second day and then a higher intensity. So this is a measure of intensity on this figure and then more of a moderate intensity and then another high intensity and then a couple days of rest. Okay. So you're increasing duration, you're changing and, and utilizing different intensities throughout this improvement phase and you'll have these physiological changes that occur resulting in better fitness. So maybe you get to a point where you're like, yeah, you know what, I feel like I've achieved my goal, I'm running a mile now in seven minutes, I need to be able to do 20 pull-ups, and you feel like, this is, a good, this is a good thing. And so you move into the maintenance phase. Some of you may never get to that maintenance phase. You may want to continue to see improvements in fitness throughout your entire lifetime, protect against the devastating effects of aging. But if you do get to a stage where you're interested in maintenance, you may actually be able to cut things back to three non-consecutive days and continue to see that same level of strength and cardiovascular endurance. Typically during the maintenance phase, we're not modulating our intensity. We're using the same amount of intensity every day. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to just be three days. You actually may be able to extend, extend it a little bit more and kind of have a little bit of improvement, a little bit of maintenance, or minor levels of improvement uh, by extending the number of days. Okay, I've already hit just very briefly on safety. I want to talk a little bit about safety, um, specific to your geographic location here. Safety concerns change depending on geographic location. Here in Georgia, one of the biggest safety concerns that we have is hot weather. If you go someplace else, maybe to my home state of Minnesota, you're also going to be a little bit nervous about really cold weather and exercise and the way we prepare for exercise outside on those really cold days becomes significantly different. I'm just going to deal with the hot weather because that's the most pressing concern in the state of Georgia. So what are the main concerns with hot weather? And there are four big concerns and they basically are a ideal, ideological sequence. I don't know if that, that's where um, and a, a progressive sequence is probably better. The four concerns deal with the water status or the hydration status of the individual and the accumulation. So while exercising in heat, dehydration accelerates. As long as you're not consuming a beverage, you're dehydrated, right? 
So when you're not actively consuming some sort of beverage, you're undergoing dehydration. If you're not actively consuming a beverage during exercise, that rate of dehydration is a self-accelerant. All dehydration is is an excessive loss of water. <coughs> now, you'll remember from some previous conversations that one of the major ways that we regulate our body temperature is by releasing sweat under the surface of our skin and then evaporates, and as it evaporates, it uh, removes heat. So as you dehydrate, you're reducing the pool of material that you have to eliminate sweat or eliminate heat from your body. So with dehydration, you actually begin to affect your body's ability to remove heat. As dehydration progresses, we go through the sequence of events. First, you'll begin to experience heat cramps. Heat cramps are a sudden onset of cramps or spasm within the skeletal muscle. And it's primarily due to the changes that are occurring as water is lost lost from the organism, the changes that occur in ion concentration. So you start to have erroneous muscle contraction that we call a cramp or a spasm. As dehydration happens or continues, the next step after you experience heat cramps is now to also begin to experience a condition called heat exhaustion. Also can be referred to as heat illness. Typically you feel exhausted. You feel very warm. The body is profusely sweating by this point, but it's not really having much of an effect on removing that heat. You feel very tired or exhausted and can be very uncomfortable. If we don't do anything to correct heat cramping and heat exhaustion, which primarily is going to be things like consumption of electrolyte containing beverages, such as Gatorade, that's not a commercial in the middle of my lecture. In fact, something that contains more than water. You could lead into this thing called heat stroke. And heat stroke is a very serious heat condition. Typically, the skin becomes very, very dry. And the reason the skin becomes very, very dry is because you sweat it out as much water as you can actually sweat out. So you've had significant decreases in blood volume. You're beginning to reduce your ability to perfuse your working tissues, including your heart and your brain. So this potentially fatal heat illness becomes a, real, a reality. The other thing that happens is with the reduction in your ability to eliminate heat through sweating, you begin to elevate the core temperature. And all of those visceral organs, including the heart and the lungs and the liver, they begin to malfunction. Heat is the uh, enemy of, excessive heat is an enemy of proper protein and cellular function. And so as heat accumulates, you begin to reduce that normal function. So heat stroke can lead towards a very fatal, dangerous event. So how do we prevent There will be several days this summer where it will be 90, 95, maybe even 100 degrees during the day, excessive humidity up in the day, 100% range. Those are days in which all of those four dehydration, heat cramp, heat exhaustion, heat stroke become much more probable. But we actually can prevent. We can actually do some things that help us to um, reduce the risk for those four concerns. One of the things is we can look at early morning sessions. Surprisingly enough, if you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning on those days and it's nearly 100 degrees, it may be only in the 60s. And that's really good. So morning sessions, you should always have fluid readily available to provide fluid replacement. Uh, one rule of thumb that I've been told is that you should always consume every 15 minutes during a workout. You should also take your body weight before the workout and after the workout. And the number of pounds that you lose, every pound you should consume two cups of water. 
to drink throughout your workout and then do a fluid replacement after. The last thing is to utilize breathable technology. These are fabric and textile technology that help to dissipate heat from an individual. And you're all familiar with some of them. Uh, Under Armour has breathable clothing that helps out with that regulation process so that you can get rid of large amounts of heat with uh, reductions in the amount of um, sweating that's required. Right, I'm just about done and then we'll move on to the exams that um, we're going to take a look at. Last thing I want to talk about is injury. Invariably, injury is going to happen. And of course, you've all probably heard the acronym before RICE. And RICE is a quick and easy way for you to manage injury. Now, that doesn't mean you just broke your leg and you should use RICE. Go to the doctor if it's a major medical event. We're talking about we're talking about really just minor aches and pains that can be associated with exercise. The RICE is an acronym, and it's rest, ice, and compression. Now, this guy up here is catching some disease. Really, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about, hey, you should just sleep more. We're actually talking about rest the injured element. So if it's your knee, rest your knee. Don't utilize your knee extensively. The I is ice, so you want to use ice. When you use ice, you should only use ice for about 10 to 15 minutes at a time. You can use it um, several times throughout the day. The ice is going to help out with numbing the pain and reducing the pain. The C is compression. You can wrap, and this is something they do a lot in athletic training, you can wrap that injured, um, that injured area put a little bit of pressure on there that helps to, um, to regulate blood flow in that area and can help out with the injury repair process. And then last is elevation. And elevation is interesting. We're just trying to get the injured item above the heart, right? And you maybe have experienced where you get a cut on your hand or something like that, you bend down and you feel it. But then you put your hand over your head and the pain dissipates. Compression and elevation are almost pain management. We know that if we can manage pain, we actually have a better um, ability to uh, reduce the time to recovery. Okay? So use rest, ice, compression, and elevation whenever you have some type of injury. Unless it's major, and then go to the doctor. 